So I know that most people that come to Thomas Big Spiders come here looking for notes and care tips for tarantulas. And this video isn't gonna feature a tarantula. So I was trying to figure out a way to get people's attention so they actually watch the video. So did I get your attention? Hey all, Tom Rand here from Tom's Big Spiders. Well, this one's been a long time coming. This video is going to be my experiences with and how to keep the Pluridae or the curtain web spiders. These are spiders that for a long time I avoided. There was some misinformation out there. Plus the fact that starting off as an arachnophobe, they just didn't appeal to me with their quickness and their little sharp spider legs. But recently I got into them and I'm absolutely loving raising them up. So this was something I've wanted to do for a little while now, but unfortunately it's taken me about a year to get all the footage that I need of them. But anybody that has watched my YouTube channel recently has noticed I put up a lot of very short feeding clips of them. That's because the only time I usually see them out and about is during feeding time. And that's okay with me because they are amazingly fun to feed. And as luck would have it, some of them were actually nice enough to grab their prey items and stay out in the open long enough for me to get some pretty decent shots of at least three of the larger species that I've kept. And I'm excited to show them off because not only are they beautiful, they're quite big. One of mine, as you'll see, got very, very large and they're just very easy to care for. So I'm hoping with this video that folks that have seen these before and never gave them any attention might give them a second look. Maybe some people that have seen them offered were kind of on the fence with them. This might be what you need to jump off the fence onto the side of keeping curtain web spiders. So enough of me talking. Let's take a look at my curtain web spiders or Diploridae. For years, there were a lot of questions about the Diploridae species offered in the pet trade. Folks who kept them spoke about their blistering speed, but their amazing beauty. But the forums were filled with questions about just how toxic or deadly their venom was. Back then, all Diploridae were generally referred to as funnel-web spiders, and there was little to no info to differentiate a bite from one of these South American species from the supposed deadly bite of the infamous Australian funnel-web. However, the Atrax genus, or Sydney funnel webs, along with other potent genera, were moved to other families, and it is now recognized that the majority of the South American curtain web spiders sold in the pet trade, including Linotheli, Harmonicon, and Diplura, are not the lethal demons they were often made out to be. That said, the first time I saw them, I was still trying to get over my arachnophobia, and a large, leggy, fast, sharp spider was still a thing of nightmares for me. However, a couple years ago, when I was over my irrational fear and armed with new knowledge, I picked up my first Diploridae species. I purchased Linotheli phallic sling, and I immediately recognized what I'd been missing. These spiders get huge, and their speed when hunting has to be seen to believed. And for those who love webbing, you can't get much better than Diploridae. As you can see in this footage here, these spiders absolutely fill their enclosures with the fluffy white stuff. Now, one question I often get asked is, are they tarantulas or true spiders? I think a lot of folks see their massive size and immediately think that a large spider equals a tarantula. Well, that's not the case. Curtainweb spiders are in the family Diploridae, and they are in the same infraorder, namely Mygelomorphi, as tarantulas. They are also related to trapdoor spiders and funnel webs, other popular spiders that are not tarantulas. Like tarantulas, they have clarissera that move up and down, as opposed to the more evolved true spiders that can move theirs from side to side. They also have two pairs of book lungs, just like tarantulas, where most true spiders have one pair. So, they are not tarantulas or true spiders. The most important thing is that they are super cool, exciting spiders that any tarantula keeper would find a joy to experience. Now that I've raised up several of these spiders from slings to robust adults, I can share some of the care tips for those interested in keeping them. So let's start out with slings. There's no need to go crazy with sling housing. You want to make sure that they have adequate moisture and can find prey and have room to grow. I've successfully kept all of mine in dram vials with about an inch or 2.5 centimeters of moist substrate and some moss or fake leaves up top for them to web to and to hide behind. I also put a couple furrows down the sides to add moisture to and for burrows. That way, when I need to add some water, I can just squirt some into one of these furrows so that the bottom layers of substrate stay moist. 
As for behavior, I find that the smaller specimens tend to like to do a bit of burrowing, but they also come up top where they do a lot of webbing. Speaking of webbing, they will drink from the webbing, so you can dribble water on the webbing at night before bed or mist the webbing by gently spritzing the water above the enclosure so that it falls down into it. To feed the tiniest ones, you may need flightless fruit flies, tiny pinhead red runners, or pinhead crickets. I had the good luck of feeding most of mine red runner nymphs, but spiderlings under a third of an inch or 0.83 centimeters might require flightless fruit flies. Now, for folks who can't find live prey that small, no worries, they will actually scavenge feed. As you can see here, my Deplora sanguini is happily munching away on a cricket drumstick or cricket leg. Several of my other species scavenge fed as well. I just drop the leg in at night and remove any extra the next day. Know that a tiny sling can fill up on a leg in just one sitting. Now, slings are obviously quite fast. However, they can't climb plastic well and normally retreat to their webbing when disturbed. The only time they might try to escape is if they chase food out of the enclosure. I found that slings eat great, molt with regularity, and put on a decent amount of size with each molt. So, even if you're starting with a teeny tiny spider, it won't be too long before it's a leggy juvenile. And speaking of juveniles, let's talk a bit about juvenile care. Now, before we get into juvenile enclosures, it's important to note that most Deplorodi species grow rather quickly and they can easily make the jump from a 2 inch or 5 centimeter juvenile to a 3 inch or 7.62 centimeter young adult. Therefore, it often makes sense to move a specimen directly from its sling enclosure and into its adult enclosure. They don't get lost in larger enclosures, they will usually set up their home base and immediately start webbing. As crickets and roaches or other prey items wander the enclosure, they will eventually trigger that webbing and alert the spider, who will come bursting out and grabbing the prey. And because the spider will continue to build its web palace over its entire lifespan, it's nice to not have to pull a juvenile out of its webbing and have it restart its home from scratch. I have put many of my 2-inch specimens into their adult enclosures, and I've had zero issues with them doing well or finding prey. I will usually drop prey right onto their webbing, and the hungry spiders will blast out and grab it in a blink. So, for folks still disturbed at the thought of dealing with the speed during rehousings, it's easy to get away with just one. And, for an extra easy rehousing, it's always good to just drop the vial or deli cup that housed it as a sling into the adult enclosure, letting the spider come out on its own. Another little tidbit that might help assuage any rehousing fears is the fact that, unlike tarantulas, the Pleuridae cannot easily climb plastic or glass. This makes containing them much easier during transfers and rehousings. Do note, however, that glass covered with substrate dust or webbing could give a startled spider enough traction to make some headway should it be intent on climbing. To be extra cautious, do all rehousings inside a much larger plastic tub to add an extra barrier against escape. For spiders that I did move into juvenile enclosures, I used a couple different things. As they like to web up the top, I wanted something that offered a bit of depth. For my first L. Phallix, I used a plastic food storage bin that measured about 7.5 by 9 by 9 inches or 19 by 23 by 23 centimeters. I filled it with about 3 inches of moist substrate, cork hides, plastic plants, and leaf litter. For my Linotheles species Panama, I used an 8 by 8 by 12 inch high or 20.32 by 20.32 by 30.48 centimeter acrylic enclosure. Again, I put in about 4 inches or 10.16 centimeters of moist sub cork hides, and some fake foliage. I moved both into the juvenile enclosures when they were about 1.5 inches or 3.8 centimeters, and they did fine until they hit about 3 inches or so. Both did a bit of burrowing before concentrating on creating their deep curtain webs up on the surface. As for what to feed juveniles, I used medium red runner roaches or crickets. However, mealworms would also work. With a mealworm, I would make sure to drop it right on the webbing so that it doesn't burrow and hide. As for the frequency I feed my spiders, it's usually about once a week or so. So once your juvenile puts it on some size and it's time to move it into an adult enclosure, there are a couple different options for you. These spiders get quite large, with some species reaching a gangly 7 inches or 17.9 centimeters, and they do a lot of webbing, so you want to give the adult some space. I've been using two main enclosure types for my adults. The first is the Barbarous or Reptile Growth 5 gallon, which measures about 8 inches by 10 inches by 15 inches, or 20.3 by 25.4 by 38 centimeters. These enclosures are crystal clear, offering a good view of the inside, and they have great ventilation. Because the top is perforated aluminum, it allows a lot of airflow and evaporation. 
For folks who want to create a bit more of a microclimate, they could easily cover part of this area with plexiglass or plastic. There is still plenty of cross ventilation on the sides. They also have a handy little feeding port on the side that means you don't have to open the enclosure to drop in prey items. These enclosures do have little gaps next to the top hatch for wires. You want to either cover these with super glue and a piece of plastic, tape, or just fill them in with hot glue. The other enclosure I use is a Zilla 5.5 gallon critter cage, which measures about 8 by 10 by 15 inches or 20.3 by 25.4 by 38 centimeters. These enclosures are the same size as the Barbarous Growth ones, except they lack some of the bells and whistles. The tops of these enclosures are wire mesh, but they don't pose the same risk to curtain webs as they do to tarantulas. Again, there is a lot of airflow, so you can replace the mesh with drilled plexiglass if you prefer. Now that I've seen just how large some of these species can get, I'm looking more at a 10 gallon size tank for some. The extra room I think would allow for some more space for webbing and for a potentially 7 inch spider. Now some folks prefer to use Exoterra minis which are 12 inches by 12 inches by 12 inches or 30.5 by 30.5 by 30.5 centimeters and I agree that one could work very well. I could even see a well furnished Exoterra mini tall with the extra 18 inch or 46 centimeter height making a good curtain web home. Because they can't climb glass well, the extra height would pose no danger, and it would allow the spider to go crazy with its vertical webbing. As for how to set up these enclosures, I give them 3 to 5 inches of substrate angled down. I give them multiple pieces of cork bark with starter burls, fake plants and branches, and a water dish. I also put some leaf litter in mine just for appearance sake, but they don't seem to use it. I always keep part of the substrate moist at all times, and I do give my adults water dishes even though they usually web them up rather quickly. As I mentioned before, I have caught them drinking off the webbing, so what I like to do with my adults is a couple nights a week, I will go in right before bedtime and dribble water on the surface. You can also miss them. They can come out and drink it just like they might drink the morning dew that would collect on their webbing in nature. As for feeding, that is my favorite time with these spiders because I can't get enough of the feeding responses, as you probably noticed by the intro of this video. When feeding mine, I provide large crickets or red runner roaches, although mealworms, locusts, and superworms would work as well. The only concern I would have with mealworms and superworms is the fact that they would burrow, so I would crush the heads. Mealworms will usually wiggle around a bit, which will trigger a feeding response. As for the superworms, you may want to drop the worm right directly in front of one of the burrow entrances so the spider can find it. Now, obviously, these are big spiders. They are fast spiders, but it's the behaviors that really make them shy. These are super shy animals. And as a matter of fact, it took me close to a year to get enough footage to even put this video together. The good news is you can easily catch them out during feeding time, but they generally grab the food and bolt back to their webs. These spiders have long, lithe, gangly legs that provide them ample speed to escape from predators, and most folks that have kept them have said that they will rely on their speed to escape any disturbances, usually retreating to their burrows to stay out of sight. Personally speaking, I have found mine to be completely easy to care for, as when I take the enclosures off of the shelves to feed them, they disappear into their dens. However, if I drop a cricket a ways out from the entrance of the den, they will often jump out to grab it, which is fantastic. Now, as mentioned earlier, these species were thought to have medically significant venom in line with the trapdoor spider and Australian funnel webs back in the day. However, it's now suspected that a bite from most of these species would not be pleasant, but it also wouldn't be medically significant. Unfortunately, there are no bite reports to go by and very little research done on the venom. Keepers report that the Pleuridae are very reluctant to bite and would much rather use their speed to escape from a situation, so bites should be easily avoided. Now, as I mentioned before, the Pleuridae do appreciate moisture and I keep mine moist at all times, no matter juveniles, slings, or adults. I do this by making sure that there's a hole through the webbing that allows me to pour water down so that it hits the substrate and I always pour the water so it goes in between the side of the enclosure in the substrate and sinks down to those lower levels so the lower levels stay moist. However, this is a species because it covers up as water dish. As I said before, I love sprinkling water on the webbing a couple times a week right before bedtime because once the lights go out, they tend to come out to explore a little bit more, do some webbing, and they will find that moisture there and they will drink from it. And I have come up in the middle of the night, turned the lights on and found them drinking from the webbing. 
So currently I'm keeping five different species of the Pluridae and quite frankly, I love all five of them. And I will continue to grab as many species as I can find on the market. So the ones I currently keep are Linotheli Sericata X Megatheloides, the Colombian Curtain Web. These guys have a gold or bronze body with legs that shimmer with purple under the correct lighting. This species supposedly reaches 4 inches or 10.16 centimeters, but again, I wonder if they can get bigger because I've had an oipoiki that we'll talk about in a moment that got much bigger than that. Another species I keep is Linotheli phallix or the tiger curtain web. These guys have bluish legs, a coppery body, and a coppery striped abdomen. They supposedly get four plus inches or 10.16 centimeters. I've heard they can get up to five inches. I can say that I have a mature male right now. Usually mature males are a bit smaller and mine is right around the four inch mark. Very gangly, large male. The third species I keep is Linotheli species Panama or the Panamanian blue curtain web. Unfortunately, I have almost zero footage of this spider because it's so shy. This has been the slowest growing overall of the ones that I have kept. The species can supposedly reach four inches or 10.16 centimeters. It's interesting to note that many folks who list this spider have labeled it as an arboreal. I'll be curious to see if the species does a bit more webbing up than my others. Next up, I've raised Harmonicon oipoki or the French Guianan black and red. This specimen is gorgeous with a red carapace, black legs, and it reminds a lot of folks of the tarantula Bumba Harita. After its last molt, it was a full seven inches or 17.8 centimeters. Now, considering that I read the species reaches about four inches, this is the one that has me believing that many can get larger than what we're giving them credit for. And the last species I just picked up, I have three slings of Diplura sanguinei. These are supposedly smaller species that get only to be about 2.5 to 3 inches or 6.3 to 7.2 centimeters. I've only had these little guys for about a month, but already they got some beautiful colors and they've already all molted once in my care. So they're off to a great start in terms of growth rate. Now, why should tarantula lovers give the Pluridae a look? I did a podcast about this one a few months ago, and I was glad that some folks heard me out and said, hey, you know what? Maybe I should give these a try. They have a lot to love for people who like tarantulas. First off, there's the size. These are big spiders who get to be four to seven inches, which is quite large. I will say my oi pokey blew my mind with that seven inch leg span. So for folks who like big spiders, there's a lot to love here. Now, for people who love webbing, and I know there's those of us out there in the tarantula hobby that absolutely love heavy webbing spiders, you're not going to get much better than these guys. They fill their entire enclosures with webbing. If you give them extra height, they'll build that webbing up even higher, and the webbing is thick. When I had to clean out the last enclosure, the webbing literally felt like the same thickness and durability as a silk shirt. It's insane. Now, they're also fast growing with most maturing in a year and a half or so. I had my last male mature out in about a year. So even if you get little teeny tiny slings, it's not going to be long before you have one of these big, beautiful spiders. And their colorations are amazing. They are leggy and they sport blues, golds, reds, bronzes, and purples. Plus, that abdomen striping is to die for. Now, for folks who are a little weary of them behavior-wise, they are easy to deal with because they would much rather run than fight. I have received zero threat postures or defensive behavior. If they get disturbed, they just boogie and hide. And as we mentioned earlier, they can't climb plastic and glass well. So it makes them much easier to contain than your average tarantula. So basically, even if it tries to boogie, once it tries to scuttle up the side, they tend to just be a flailing mass of limbs. You can easily place a cup over them, get them up, out, and into the new enclosure. And their feeding sponsors. What else can I say? A picture's worth a thousand words. So as I'm talking here, here's a couple videos of them eating. I will never get tired of feeding these guys, watching them explode from their enclosures, grab that prey in a blink of an eye. It's just absolutely amazing. Now, the one turnoff to these guys, and it tends to be a turnoff for folks in general that are looking into keeping things other than tarantulas, are the lifespans. And I will say there is a lot of differing information out there about the lifespans. Some report that females can live 10 to 25 years of age, but this info seems to be based on conjecture by comparing them to trapdoor spiders that live an extra long life. 
I've heard from folks who have kept them before that three to four years might be more accurate. I've heard from others that say five to six. I will obviously definitely report out what I discover as time goes by. I can say that I've had males mature in just over a year or so, so the males at least have shorter life cycles. My female Oipoki was around two and a half or three or so when she went, so I thought that one went a little bit early, but time will tell. I hope they live longer. They obviously live a bit longer than your average true spider, but this is something I will obviously be keeping an eye on and reporting about. So there you have it, care for depleuridized species. There are a lot of these offered on the market, and I would say any of them would be a good one to start off with. If I had to pick a favorite, I don't think I could. I love my alphalics. That was the first one I got. My Saracatas are coming along nicely and gorgeous, and that oi pokey, that thing with that red carabus is just amazing. And the fact that that female hits seven inches still has my mind blown. I can't believe how big it got. But these guys, if you can't tell from my enthusiasm talking about them, are awesome, and they've been kind of a revelation for me in the hobby. I wish I had kept them years ago, and I can tell you right now, I will be continuing to try to get every one of them that enters the hobby, and I plan on keeping them for many, many years to come. So one thing that wasn't mentioned in this video are temperatures. Anybody that watches my videos knows that my temperatures aren't particularly high here. During the winter time, we're talking anywhere from about 70 to 73 degrees, depending upon which shelf they're on. Sometimes it gets a little bit cooler when the heat fails to keep up on the super, super cold days. And having raised these guys now or some of these guys for like two and a half years, they've gone through a couple winters, no issues there. Summertime, it gets much warmer up here. Right now, it's about 80. Usually, it's anywhere from about 78 to 85 degrees. And again, they do quite well with that. So no issue with the temperatures, no extra heat needed. I've had people ask, do you need to make a false bottom with these guys? That's when you put some type of drainage layer underneath, maybe a screen and the substrate on top of that. I did do it with one just to try it out, but I've had no issue with the other ones keeping those bottom layers moist. It's just not how I do things. Is there anything wrong with that? No, not at all. And if that's something you want to do for extra peace of mind, by all means, go for it. Now, I know a lot of people are probably watching this right now going, nope, not for me. And I totally understand it because I remember the first time I saw a video of one of these spiders, my first thought was, wow, look at the sharpness on the legs of that tarantula. And then I realized I wasn't looking at a tarantula. And at that point on, that really triggered my arachnophobia. And I remember watching this video kind of out of the corner of my eye, like, man, these things are creepy. And I've heard from many folks that because of their size and their speed and the way those little legs flop all around when they run, that they are arachnophobes' worst nightmare. So if you're somebody getting into the hobby, obviously that is still scared of tarantulas, still has a fear of them. These might be something you want to pass on for the time being, although they're very easy to contain. Somebody that's afraid of spiders might just have a hard time even watching them try to climb the walls of those enclosures. But for folks that already have some experience keeping tarantulas, I think these would be very easy for folks to segue right into them. Again, very easy to keep, grow fast, beautiful, and the fact that they can't climb the walls of Plastic or glass makes them much easier to contain than your basic fast tarantula. All right, so that's going to do it for this one. As always, if you liked it enough to subscribe, very much appreciate. Click the little circle up in there. I'll put some other videos over in here. If you take the time to comment, know that I will take the time to respond. It could just take me a couple days. That'll do it for this one, guys. As always, stay safe. We'll catch you all next time.